Billy and Dim Chapter 1 Red Little Red Riding Hood wasn't so little anymore. In fact, she was a full-grown woman and not only that but a powerful sorceress, too. The only remains of her past were the Red Riding Hood she always wore, whatever the weather, and her nickname, Red. Billy for his part had changed very little. He was the big bad wolf or at least that was what the wanted posters and frightened villagers called him, but in reality it couldn't be further from the truth. Behind his thick muscles woolly beard and rough shirt lay a soft heart. He was a great teacher to Red and he knew exactly who he was. The two were an unconventional pair but they liked it that way. They wandered from forest to mountain, town to village, begging and charming their way into room and board and discovering the deep dark secrets of magic. It had been a long time since Billy had taught Red her first spell in the ruins of her wicked grandmother's home all those years ago and yet Red felt like she would never learn all the possibilities of magic for the world held countless mysteries. Do you think they're still looking for you?" said Billy in his stony voice as they walked downhill. Red gave him a questioning look. And I thought I was the one lost in reminiscing. Have you been thinking back to that day? Just the mention of it brought a smell of burnt skin to her nose. Yes, which is odd. There are far more exciting battles to reminisce about. I was thinking of something important when we started climbing this hill, but it was swept from my mind. Red blinked. What was I thinking about? Hmm, said Billy. He sniffed. There's something in the air here. Look. He put his arm out and pointed. Gradually she noticed what he was pointing to a thin kind of pollen almost invisible in the breeze. The grin of discovery spread over the werewolf's lips. Perhaps our reminiscing is not as innocent as we thought. Have you heard of environmental magic altering thoughts? She loved the way he did that always asking questions he already knew the answer to. Of course she hadn't heard of it. Everything she knew about magic she knew from him. And yet he always asked as if he had as much to learn from her as she did from him. No, she said, grinning. That sounds like something worth investigating. They figured out which way the pollen was coming from and ran in that direction, jumping over logs and pushing through branches. Billy went ahead, as always, his werewolf strength allowing him to easily clear a path, with Red following behind him. As the pollen in the air grew thicker, Red's mind was flooded with ever more vivid images, the soup her mother had made for her when she was sick, her first kiss, the sight of her grandmother's dead body, empty of magic. She tried to erase the last one from her mind, but there was no use, it was immediately replaced by another image and then another. Meals, smiles, tears and scenery flashed before her wildly. Finally they reached the source of the pollen, a group of fat, heavy flowers similar to sunflowers in shape, although it was hard to see them through the fog of images in her mind. Funny, I've never seen a flower like this, said Billy kneeling towards it. Is it dangerous? Dangerous? Billy said staring into the flower. Why should it be? Red's first night with Billy played before her, the shine of the moon melting into the sunny forest. She bit the inside of her cheeks to try and focus herself. It's just like that spell. Spell? Billy muttered. He moved ever closer to the flower. You know that. Ah, where are we again? She was standing on a cliff by the sea watching the fishing boats bring in their prize. In Cractitha's arms whispered Billy. And no. Who's that? Red blinked. She was lying naked in bed but she felt clothes rub against her. And why were there birds singing in her bedroom? This must be a dream. No, shouted a familiar voice. Red heard a ripping sound. The moon burst into stardust. 
the fishing boat sank into the sea. The familiar walls of her bedroom cracked away. She saw a friend standing in front of her, but what was his name? Red cried the man, shaking her shoulders. We have to. Oh, curses! His arms swept under her and he carried her through the forest, when had they gotten there? Some strange yellow dots flew all around her, getting thinner as they moved. Her stomach shook with every step. Why are you running so fast? Granny, I still have a fever. No, you don't, growled the man holding her. Billy, was that his name? You're in the Caption Forest with Billy, your handsome, strong, intelligent werewolf friend, who's far better at spotting wicked magic than you. No more fairy tales, Red groaned. Can't I just sleep? Absolutely not. They arrived at a river where Billy threw her onto the ground. Ouch, she cried. The man pulled a waterskin out of his pack, filling it up and pushing it towards her. Drink. No, groaned Red, crawling away. Her stomach felt warm, soft, comfortable, like the bed she lay on. No, was that grass? Fine then. We'll do this the hard way. Open your mouth. Red pressed her lips together and tried to crawl away, but Billy held her down with strong arms. He forced her jaw open, and she thought he was going to pour the water in, but instead he stuck two fingers down her throat. Red sat up and threw up onto the grass. It felt like throwing up the remains of a fire, and when she saw the thick orange mess before her, she wondered what the hell she'd eaten. The images faded gently away. She wasn't at home. She was in the caption forest, just like Billy had said. But what about the ocean, she muttered. She had smelt it. Looks like you need another go, Billy said seriously, moving towards her. No, said Red, holding her arms up. I'm back, I promise. It'll go, whatever it was. Billy nodded, threw her the waterskin, and got to work throwing up himself. He was more thorough than her, throwing up three times, until he was only coughing up air. Then he drank greedily from the river. Red sipped on water and looked at what had come out of them. The bright orange color came from the bits of pollen she realized which had stuck together. Just what was that stuff, she asked. Nothing natural to hear. It was planted and perhaps enhanced by magic. You mean a trap? Billy nodded. I'm almost impressed, but it was obvious from the roots that the plants had been taken from somewhere else. Red looked around, but she could not see or hear anyone aside from birds and insects. Do you think someone in the last town found out about us? No, said Billy, shaking his head. This is a professional. Could have any number of reasons for coming after me. Us. And those reasons are? Billy chuckled. We'll save those stories for the road. I realized what it was the moment I started thinking about my ex. I have a strong charm placed on myself to prevent such thoughts. Anything that can break that charm is powerful magic. Red raised an eyebrow. Billy had never talked much about his romantic past and she desperately wanted to find out the details, but if he had charmed the memories away, it had to be unpleasant. She was brought back to reality by the grumbling of her stomach. Ugh, well there goes our delicious breakfast. And it took me so long to convince that bird to give up its eggs. Anxiously she looked up at the sky. The sun was far lower than she would have liked. They were hungry, exhausted, and being followed by someone, and evening was approaching. We have two options, Billy said, his voice low and soft. We find food and set up camp here tonight, or we walk until we arrive in town, however late it is. What do you think, Chief? I think it would be stupid to set up camp in a forest that might be entirely charmed against us. Exactly. Let's get moving. 
Red drank from the river and stood up, groaning at the way her muscles ached. It was going to be a long walk. When's the full moon? Night after next. But don't worry I have enough supplies. Or maybe we could get rid of this hunter the old-fashioned way. Demetrius. So the rogue wolf was smarter than he looked. Demetrius was quietly impressed. Judging from his appearance he had thought Billy nothing more than a charming idiot with powerful uncontrolled magic, but actually the werewolf held a remarkable control over it. As for the girl he couldn't quite decide about her. He had thought her a prisoner of the wolf, but she was far more independent than expected. Still there was no doubt that the wolf would rip her apart if she tried to escape, assuming he hadn't already forced her loyalty with a magical contract. Still he couldn't feel sorry for her. She was dangerous, too, and from the report he'd been given about the incident with the girl's grandmother it was unclear who had committed the murder. Demetrius's first thought, that the pair would be unable to resist the temptation of unknown magic, had been correct, but he had underestimated their ability to handle it. Well, he wouldn't make that mistake again. He made himself comfortable in the tree he was hiding in and listened in to their waterskin, which he had bugged with magic. Find an inn to stay the night and leave early tomorrow. Get as far away as we can. If the werewolf felt under pressure, he hid it well. No time to stop for a little fun? Red teased. That's what got us into trouble last time. Demetrius could hear the grin on the werewolf's voice even through the gurgle-gurgle of the water skin. The werewolf's voice sounded different through it, in a way that made Demetrius' ears feel funny. The potential for troubles never stopped you from doing something before. True, true. But I can't stand the way you just sit and watch. Don't you ever want to find some girl of your own? Demetrius forced himself to back away from the conversation. He had the information he needed, they were stopping at the inn in the next village. Demetrius jumped out of the tree and climbed onto his horse. She complained as he did so. The old horse still seemed to hate him, though he could never tell why. Perhaps she smelt a bit of wolf on him? No, that's been long erased, he muttered to himself. He adjusted his black wool coat, boiling hot in this warm weather. But he couldn't take it off. He had promised. He kicked the horse into action, he couldn't even remember the animal's name, and rode through the forest to the village of Norin. There, he put up his horse at the inn, the beggar's hand, and marched inside to talk to the owner. Demetrius Alamu, he declared, casually lifting up his sleeve to reveal his six-pointed star tattoo. I require your assistance. The heavy woman did not look happy at the sight of the symbol, but she grunted and said, What do you need me to do? I'll need to prepare a meal and a room for some particular guests tonight. Would you show me to the ladder now? Right this way, O oh great one, she said, waving a hand. Demetrius ignored her rudeness and followed her up the stairs. He couldn't prevent a smile from pushing its way onto his lips. Oh, he'd wipe the grin off that handsome face. The werewolf and his student were going to have a lot of trouble tonight, indeed. Billy and Dim Chapter 2 Billy. Gods Billy could have done without the memory of Cracktooth. It had been at least four years now, but the scars burned like they were formed yesterday especially after so long being charmed away. My feet hurt, Red muttered. Usually this was where Billy jumped up, full of energy, and encouraged Red along. But even he was exhausted. The charmed flowers had worn him out more than he'd revealed. The memory of his ex's words were like a knife in his side. Just stop the magic stuff for one day. It makes me uneasy. Billy shuddered. Red raised an eyebrow at him. You cold? There's a first for everything. 
Eventually, after hours of walking along the dark path in near silence, the lights of Norin shone in the distance. Billy had been there once before, many years ago, and to his memory the only famous thing about the village was that they had a horse who had played a decisive role in an attack on a nearby family of vampires. Billy grinned at that. If only they knew who would be staying there tonight. Thankfully there had been no sign of their hunters since that afternoon and no more traps. As they approached the beggar's hand, the smell of freshly baked pie came towards them and Billy's stomach growled like, well, a wolf. About time he groaned. When they opened the door, a wave of noise, sights and smells hit them. It looked like the whole village was packed in there, which made sense since there was no other entertainment around apart from the famous horse. Many eyes turned to look at them and Billy noticed a few looks of interest from both guys and girls, but for the most part they quickly returned to their drinking and dancing, cards and kissing. Room for two and dinner for three, Billy said to the barwoman. The girl gave a little jump when she saw him, which was odd. He didn't think he looked particularly threatening after a whole day of trekking through the forest. Oh, of course. Please. She pointed to the single empty table which was pushed into the corner of the room. Can we put our things in our room first, said Red. Oh, right, said the girl, blinking like a surprised rabbit. I'll carry those up. She took their packs and struggled under the weight, but she bravely marched up the stairs without a look behind her. How odd, said Billy as they sat down. You think she liked you? Red snorted. I think you're seeing things again. They had just sat down when a plate with three steaks was carried over to them by an old woman who looked even tougher than the meat she was carrying. Billy licked his lips. That was quick. Red made a face. We smelled pie when we came in. Do you have any left? The woman grunted. She looked far too old to be a barwoman, and Billy had a faint memory of her being the owner, from his last visit. Must have been a busy night for her to carry food around like a young girl. This is all we have. Red sighed and smiled. Well, thank you then. You're too polite, said Billy, taking a big bite out of his steak. It took considerable self-control not to pick it up with his hands. One would think you've been traveling around with your noble uncle, not a horrible hairy werewolf. Wait, said Red, holding up a hand. There's a hair on my food. She lifted the thick blonde hair with her fork. I'm just going to see if they have anything else. Billy grabbed her arm as she stood up. Come on, don't start making a scene here, he said, bits of meat flying out of his mouth. We have to discuss our plans for tomorrow. I'll only be a minute, she said, brushing him off. Billy hated eating alone. Despite the fact that he'd run away from his pack long ago, he was still a social creature. Red was his pack and without her the dry, tough meat tasted awful. But at the very least it filled up his stomach and relaxed his mind. But seriously had they heard of spices here? Red returned a few minutes later with her face the color of her riding hood, carrying her hair-covered steak. No luck. Red shook her head. I overheard the owner talking to someone. A man I didn't see him properly. He was asking her for a key and she was complaining. Then he went quiet and I looked through the door and saw something on his arm. Probably just some desperate night with a lonely traveler, said Billy, although he couldn't imagine being lonely enough to want to sleep with her. What was it, a golden bracelet or something? A tattoo of a six-pointed star. Billy spat out the piece of meat he was chewing, sending it flying into Red's hair. The girl didn't even react strongly, just picked it out with her fork. He blinked furiously, forcing his brain to work. What? said Red. A six-pointed star. 
He realized he was shouting so he leant in close and brought his voice down to a whisper. That's the sign of strictus. Never heard of it. Right. Of course she wouldn't know. They're an organization wrapped in secret, but what I do know is that they hate free werewolves. And vampires and all things of that nature. They want magic to be controlled. Billy stared down at his food. Curses. I shouldn't be eating this. He pushed his plate away. Red's eyes widened. So the flowers and now the food is. Do you feel okay? I'm fine, said Billy rubbing his eyes. No, im tirat. Gods be damned. He pushed the plate away and dug his nails into his hands. He needed to stay awake. So the room will be trapped as well, said Red. Oh, right. Billy couldn't think straight. We can't move on, he muttered. We're too weak. And the agent will follow us. Red glanced around the room and Billy's eyes followed. But it all mixed into a vague mess. Can't seduce anyone like this, said Billy resting his chin on his hand. So we can't get into another room. For a brief second his eyes fell closed but then his hand slipped and he jumped awake. What are we going to do, said Red, panic in her voice. Stay calm. We're going to, come on, Billy think. When the staff aren't looking, we'll throw these stakes out to the dogs. Then we'll go to our room. Red gave him a look of alarm. If he's waiting there to attack us, we'll be ready. And if not, well, we'll prepare to attack him. It was a weak plan, but it was all his drugged mind could come up with. He had eaten about half of the first steak, but the drug had clearly been strong. It would be hours before he was himself again. Hopefully he had the energy to break some strictest bones. If not, he supposed he would find out just how well he had trained Red. Thankfully the bar was busy enough that it wasn't tricky to dispose of the food. They pretended they were going out to use the bathroom, hiding the steaks into their packs and throwing them to the dogs fighting outside. Then they brought their plates up to the bar. Delicious, Billy said, giving a theatrical yawn. We'd like to go to our room now. The woman nodded and silently led them up the stairs. She showed them to the last door at the end of a dark corridor and, in a weak attempt at hospitality, said, Sweet dreams. They waited for her to leave and Billy slowly turned the knob. But when they entered the room it looked entirely normal, with a small double bed and some damaged closets. Billy sniffed and caught the scent of magic. Red, check there aren't any bugs in the walls. You know how they keep me awake. Billy went and lit all the candles in the room. Then he fell onto the bed but thought better of it and sat on the edge. The drugs were starting to wear off but he was still dangerously close to falling asleep. Red quietly went and ran a hand over the walls, knitting her eyebrows together as she spell-searched them. Red threw Billy a few looks, uncertain if she should continue, but he nodded each time. When she reached a section next to the closet she jumped and the hairs on her arms stood up. Billy jumped up and placed his hand on the wall. Reveal yourself, he barked. A rectangular outline of sharp white light spread out around his hand and the two of them stepped back. A worn door faded out of the wall. For a second there was silence and then the knob turned and Billy got ready to fight. The door swung open and a figure in black jumped out, holding a blade, but Billy knocked it aside and tackled the man to the floor. Red swore loudly as Billy pinned the man to the ground, pulled up his arm and ripped back the wool fabric to reveal the six-pointed star. "'Why are you here?' grunted Billy. The strictest agent said nothing and reached with his free hand, grabbing Billy's thigh. The werewolf felt the bite of electricity and quickly removed the hand, trapping both of them under his knees. 
You're outnumbered two to one, Billy said, leaning down by his neck. If you try a single spell your toast. Still silence. The man's breathing came slow and steady beneath him. Moonlight spilled onto both of them through the window, the moon was almost full. Billy drew on its power. His nails and teeth grew sharp. He let out a deep growl. Do you know what happens when a werewolf bites a human's neck, he said, making sure his breath was hot and strong in the man's ear. This was the part where the human started sweating at the very least. But the man remained unnaturally calm. Billy pushed into his neck, rubbing his teeth ever so gently against the man's pale skin. He shuddered and Billy breathed in deeply through his nose. MMM smells like. He was going to say tasty human a, but that wasn't true. The man's scent was heavily masked under layers of lemon and roses, but Billy had a strong nose, and it was certainly not the smell of a human. You're a Taking advantage of Billy's surprise, the strictest agent freed his hands, gripped Billy's waist, and sent electricity through him. Billy shuddered and fell to the floor. The man's face went red with anger as he pulled out a thin, silvery rope, but just as he was about to tie him up, Red ran forward, grabbing his head in her hands. Forget about me, she said. Time to sleep. The agent hit her in the stomach, but she maintained her grip and her spell soon took effect. The man passed out. Billy shook the remains of the spell off him and stood up. This rope, said Red, examining it. Stops magic. Use it on him. Red tied up their prisoner's wrists and Billy pulled him onto the bed. Now he could get a proper look at him. He was dressed in some strange woolen suit covered with trousers and a thin white shirt. He was young, easily less than thirty, and if he hadn't just sent electricity through him, Billy might have even thought he had a kind of naive beauty to him, with his smooth face and blonde hair. Far too smooth a face for what he was. He's a werewolf. What? said Red. Billy leant over and examined the sleeping man's face. A five o'clock shadow was pushing through his boyish cheeks. Probably full of self-hatred. Are we going to kill him? said Red. There was a storm going on in Billy's stomach. He had just been threatening to bite him and turn him into a werewolf, which for most humans was basically death, but this guy wasn't a human. Not before we question him. Besides, peaceful methods are probably best. If Strictus thinks we're a real threat, they'll send more force after us. Then it's a memory charm and we throw him in the river, right? said Red eagerly. We'll see. By the way, he said, putting on his teacher voice, the reason I asked you to search the room is because he placed a charm on his hiding place. Only someone unaware of the spell can find what's hidden. So you used my inexperience against me, said Red, pretending to be offended. That's what students are for, he said, grinning. The man on their bed moved and his eyes started to open. Billy grabbed his chin, forcing him to look him in the eyes. Tell me your name, dog, he spat. Or I'll break your pretty little neck. For the first time, the agent looked genuinely scared. He had bright blue eyes like fresh rain. Demetrius, he croaked, then bit his lip. What a ridiculous name, said Billy, giving a cruel grin. From now on you're dim. And let me make one thing clear, Dim, if you try any more tricks or traps, I won't hesitate to kill you. Understood? Dim gulped. You don't know what you're dealing with. Oh, believe me, I do. Another memory of Cracktooth came to his mind, his lover leaving that morning, the last time Billy had seen him. Goodbye, Billy. For your sake, I hope we never meet again. I'm the big bad wolf. You're the one who should be worried about running into me. Billy came back to the present. He couldn't get lost in those thoughts. 
All right, Wolfie, yes, I know you're one of us, don't look so surprised. Perfumes and razors can only cover so much. Here's what's going to happen. I'm going to ask questions and you're going to answer them truthfully or else you'll find out just how powerful the big bad wolf really is. Billy and Dim Chapter 3 Demetrius Demetrius should have been angry. He should have felt scared at the very least. But as the hulking werewolf stared down at him, his hands pressing into Demetrius' jaw, he felt something different. Something that he had long pushed down. Tell me your name, dog, spat the big bad wolf. Or I'll break your pretty little neck. A deep, dark part of Demetrius' mind thought, maybe I'd like that, a thought which he quickly silenced. Demetrius. Wait, no, he hadn't intended to give him his name. A sweat broke out on him, the wolf had him flustered, and suddenly all his training had disappeared. Focus, Demetrius. He'd already failed spectacularly in his plan that evening. He didn't need to make it worse by revealing all his secrets. What a ridiculous name, said Billy, giving a cruel grin. From now on you're dim. And let me make one thing clear, dim, if you try any more tricks or traps I won't hesitate to kill you. Understood? Demetrius gulped. The name should have made him feel stupid, but somehow he liked it? You don't know what you're dealing with, he said, trying to sound threatening. Oh, believe me, I do. A glassy look passed over the wolf's eyes, and for a while he said nothing. Then he spoke again. All right, Wolfie, yes, I know you're one of us, don't look so surprised. Perfumes and razors can only cover so much. Demetrius couldn't stop himself from going red. There was nothing more he hated than being reminded of his disgusting nature. Here's what's going to happen. I'm going to ask questions and you're going to answer them truthfully or else you'll find out just how powerful the big bad wolf really is. Demetrius said nothing. What could he do? His wrists were tightly bound and even if they weren't, there was a hulking beast leaning over him, pushing him into the bed, with his magical student to the side, ready to help if necessary. That had been his mistake. He'd underestimated the girl. Why are Strictus after us? Demetrius was surprised. Most targets of Strictus weren't even aware of its name. This wolf was more clever than he seemed. I'll never tell you, said Demetrius, attempting to use some of his training again. The wolf sighed. All right then. We're going to do this the hard way. Red, go close off the room, make sure no sound can escape. Demetrius practically laughed. He may have been terrible at laying traps and keeping his mouth shut, but torture was one thing that every member of Strictus was well prepared for. With his magic bound he wouldn't be able to heal himself so easily but still he wouldn't let out a single cry of pain. A strange smile passed over the big bad wolf's lips. He placed his hands on Demetrius' cheeks. They were warm and solid and Demetrius felt a strange feeling in his chest along with the smooth touch of magic. What was he doing? I do quite like blonde beards murmured the wolf. A few seconds later, Demetrius understood. Hair sprouted from his cheeks, pushing against the hands that held them. Demetrius' heart beat hard in his chest. What kind of torture was this? But it was effective, it had shaken him up. He couldn't stand how he looked with a beard. Oh, how pretty, said the wolf, once the beard had grown to a decent size. And then he started stroking it. Demetrius felt disgusted. But suddenly he stopped. Demetrius felt a pain in his chest. Why had he stopped? Next, the wolf slipped a hand under his woolen suit and placed it on his chest. Demetrius shuddered, bringing out an even bigger smile from the werewolf. 
Thick hairs sprouted from Demetrius' chest wrapping around the wolf's fingers. In his stomach he felt a sickness, but it met with another feeling, one he didn't fully understand. As much as he wanted every reminder that he was a werewolf taken from his body, there was a certain strange joy in having the hairs grown like this. How long has it been since you grew your hair, said the wolf. Why do you care? Oh, are you not enjoying this, Dim? He pulled his hand away suddenly. Demetrius was hit by a wave of cold. Of sea course I'm not. Sounds like you were, said the big bad wolf, placing his hand on Demetrius' neck, his expression casual. Want me to continue, Dim? All that came out was a weak sound, NGGH. Gods, how did this beast have such a hold over Demetrius? He was sweating and sweating even though the night was cold and his strictest training felt like a distant dream. I'll take that as a yes. Slowly ever so slowly he slid his hand down his neck and back to his chest. When his magic flowed into Demetrius again he exploded with desire. So tell me Dim. Why are your group after us? Every hair that grew felt like a nail stabbing into his skin, and yet, the push of Billy's hand on his chest felt. You'll never tame your wolf if you continue like this, snapped Professor Banner in his head. His old teacher had never had patience for Dim's, no, he was Demetrius, damn it, Demetrius' poor concentration. Ethel, he said. Red walked over from her spot guarding the door and leant over the bed. What do you know about my grandmother? Demetrius had forgotten she was there, so focused he was on Billy. We know you killed her. One of you. Oh, damn. He was supposed to not be answering their questions. But Billy had him completely flustered. How did you find out? shouted Red. Clearly this was a difficult subject for her. Maybe this was something Demetrius could use. I won't tell you, he grunted. I've got this, said Billy looking at Red. The sweet, honey-like tone from their private conversations was back. Reluctantly Red returned to the door and the big bad wolf leaned back over Demetrius, his legs pushing into his waist. Why do you wear this awful thing, he said, slipping a finger under Demetrius' woolen suit. Demetrius bit the insides of his mouth. That was a secret he would never reveal. Billy leant even closer, pressing his face to Demetrius' chest and sniffing. The agent shivered, smelling Billy's own scent. And gods it smelt sweet. Like wildflowers. It's charmed, Billy said plainly. Just some magic defense. Billy shook his head. The perfume the shaving now this. They don't let you shift, do they? Demetrius felt like the wolf had cut open his stomach, reached inside and pulled everything out. So I can turn into a wild beast like you? I would never do such a thing. It's called self-control. Billy gave a questioning expression, his hands still resting on Demetrius' chest. You're such an expert at self-control that you need a charmed bodysuit to control yourself? Oh, curses, he knew. How was this wolf so damn clever? It's just a precaution, Demetrius stammered. You're a terrible liar, Dim. The nickname cut into him. I wonder. What would happen if I took off your suit, tied you up and left you out in the full moon? The idea of having his clothes taken off by Billy excited Demetrius, there was no point in denying it now but then he realized what he was actually saying. You wouldn't dare. Try me little wolf. You'd undo all those hours of shaving in just a few minutes and I bet you it would feel good. Shut up, cried Demetrius sounding more childish than he'd intended. I've been trained. I wouldn't transform. Some of us can actually control our magic. Billy chuckled. Right now you can't even control your desire towards me. 
Demetrius' cheeks burned red. It was bad enough that he was attracted to this beast, but was it that obvious? I'm going to ask you one last time, Dim. Tell us everything you know about Ethel and why exactly Strictus want us. If you don't, we'll work a memory charm on you so strong you'll forget you were born and throw you on a boat going down the river. Oh, and you'll never get to kiss me, which I'm sure you're dying to do. It doesn't matter. They'll find out. Hmm, said Billy raising an eyebrow. So they're tracking you? Curses and hellfire, this wolf was clever. He pulled up Demetrius' wrist and sniffed his star tattoo, making an unpleasant expression. I thought this was for more than just show. Red. The girl came over, apparently unbothered by the whole situation. Demetrius couldn't stand to look at her, so embarrassed he was by his failure. Mask the magic on this while I get the rest of the information from our friend here. Red placed a soft hand over Demetrius' tattoo and started mumbling magic words. She would have a tough time masking the spell, but if she had even a quarter of the power Ethel had. How did you defeat her anyway, said Demetrius, desperate to fight back. Nah, uh, uh, I'm asking the questions here. Tell me, how did you find out that we killed Ethel and lived to tell the tale? Demetrius gulped. That was a question he didn't know the answer to, but he didn't dare admit it to the wolf. Just kill me. Don't bother with the memory charm. Nice try, Dim. But if we kill you this tattoo's going to sound an alarm, isn't it? One that can't be masked. Done, said Red, sighing deeply and moving back. Want me to start working on the memory charm? Billy stared at Demetrius and said nothing. He was making some kind of plan. I've got a better idea, he murmured. You're gonna call me crazy, Red. Then, without warning, he gripped Demetrius' woolen suit and ripped it open. What are you doing, shrieked the agent. Billy ignored him, ripping his shirt and the wool apart with his claws. You wearing anything under here? he grunted. And no. Then I'll close my eyes. Within minutes he had removed Demetrius' clothes and completely destroyed the woolen suit. Demetrius could only sit there like a rabbit in the jaws of a fox, unable to stop him. But true to his word, the werewolf did not look at his naked body. Once he was done, he threw the bedsheets over him to make him look decent. What in the hell are you doing, hissed Red. I changed my mind. No memory charm. He needs our help. Our help? This werewolf is full of self-hate. I intend to change that. Billy placed his rough hand on Demetrius' forehead in an oddly gentle way. Demetrius had given up on understanding his intentions. If you're trying to seduce me, just do it, you wild beast. Billy shook his head, suddenly serious. I would never do such a thing. Good night, Dim. The sleeping spell passed through Demetrius' hair and his eyes slipped shut. The last thing he saw before falling asleep was a strange look on Billy's face. It almost looked like pity.